All right. I'm sitting down with uh, David Cowan. Tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you come into poetry? Uh, I, I am the tenth child of eleven. My mother was an English teacher, and I went back to school when I was in eighth grade and got a master's and then uh, partly toward a PhD. She taught English. And then she would come home from school and part of her lesson plan is she would bring these vinyl records of uh, Robert Frost and Carl Sandburg and W.H. Auden, Dylan Thomas, and she would play them. And I would sit down and by her and listen to them. And these wonderful, they were mono and the one single little needle on the, on the vinyl and the crackling noise as they spoke because we didn't have a very good player. And it was just wonderful to listen, and it, it sort of broadened my mind, and I wanted to be a poet. Uh, of course, I wanted to be a good one, so that's, a def that's definitional still, but we'll see. I'm still growing. Okay, um, so can, can you expand on why you, you're a poet today? Oh, well, it, it's a couple of uh, things, and I have, I go, I have gone in and out of it sometimes because I get frustrated with the art. Um, there is something about the uh, expression of a thought and an emotion even in poetic form that to me is is a, is, a, is a wonderful art form and you know I do write fiction and I publish fiction uh, and it's usually in the horror or fantasy genre but the problem with that of course it takes day, you know months to get even a short story sometimes poetry I can usually it, it's something that comes to me when I'm driving or doing something the kernel of it comes in and you know, and I've sometimes sworn myself, I said, well, you know, I want to just kind of stop for a while. But you can't help yourself sometimes, you got to sit there. I did have a period of time in the, in the 2000s where I was sort of making myself right, and I was publishing a lot online, and I got, didn't like what I was writing. And so I just stopped for about three, four years, didn't write anything, to maybe like one poem a year, and then came back to it and decided to, to come back to it. And I sort of thought, I kind of had, I was going through, uh, you know, sick members of the family, uh, you know, parents and uh, in-laws you know, as they were getting older and stuff, and you can't, to me, you can't write when you're in the middle of an emotional issue because you haven't filtered it all out, you haven't figured out what it is you want to say. You're just emoting if you do that. And so I had to get through a lot of that, but, and then once that sort of had passed, then I was able to sit down and start focusing again and, and putting some pieces together, and I started trying to publish again. So knock on wood, I've been doing okay the past few years. Uh, throughout your poetry career, have you had any influences, any kind of mentors or teachers? Uh, mentors, yes. And uh, Paul Ruffin of uh, you know, uh, San Houston State, who was a former poet laureate, he was my poetry teacher. And he was quite influential on me. And he had some students uh, that uh, were very, very close to me. They were good friends, and they went. Uh, and like one of them now is a professor at Texas State University, and he, Roger Jones, and he was a wonderful poet. And looking at, partly was this idea, uh, Ruffin, Ruffin did not like a lot of contemporary poetry that was so difficult and so obscure. He liked that people couldn't get a handle on it. He liked to write uh, memories, childhood events of growing up in Mississippi, in southern Mississippi, and he focused on very specific things. And so, you know, you take your universal theme and apply it to a specific thing. Uh, and he taught me that. And I, I went from, uh, I learned how to write, really, through him and through the people that were part of our group. Um, let, let's talk a bit about your publishing career. Uh, so have you, you said you've published a couple of things. Have, have you appeared in any journals, anthologies? Or? Uh, this is, I'll go through, I have one book of poems that I published, which was a PW Press in 2000 or 2001. It's out of print, unfortunately. And that was about, uh, I guess, maybe 100 pages of poems, different poems. And that was kind of a collection. But over the years, um, way back, back when I was in college, and then early years after that, I did a lot of publication in the hard journals for uh, Sam Houston Press, uh, George Mason University, the old Pan American University had a press, uh, Stephen F. Austin, uh, there was others, and then I, uh, I didn't work, so you know, I kind of, uh, I stopped. It was really difficult to keep sending stuff out and wait three years to hear back, and so I just sort of gathered poems, and when the online uh, boom came in, I started trying to publish again, and I wound up doing different, you know, bulletin boards and mailing lists that we had, poetry exchange mailing lists, sort of an internet group, and then I 
started getting online journals and some other journals that got published in England and Australia and Canada and different places in the States. Some newspapers actually picked up some poems. Uh, some of them they saw on these uh, boards that I was on. I wanted, you know, something like a beta board you'd call it now, I guess, where you sort of exchanging thoughts on how a little workshopping online. And I worked through that and then um, started getting into more into fiction recently. So I've got several things that I've, I've, I've published that. Most recently was a, like I said, a novelette. Um, it's horror, fantasy, it's on zombies. And uh, I'm a lawyer, so I, I'm trying to create lawyer punk. So it's dealing with uh, uh, civil rights, uh, the civil rights of zombies. And it's a humorous story, as you might guess. So, and I've had a lot of that. I've been very lucky. I also had a poem that the Canadian Broadcasting Company picked up. Uh, dealing with 9-11 in the aftermath and they used it on a radio show. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's one of these things where no one's ever heard of me, which is true, but I felt lucky because I've done well with that. Just once in a while things happen and I publish something where uh, it seems significant. I actually had one, there was an anthology on the Challenger that a national press asked me to put in one of my poems in. So it's, and it's kind of over the years. I, the hard part is I'm working full time I can't devote full time to it, and so uh, it, it hindered my ability to, you know, crank stuff out and become a machine or something like that. With it. Okay. Um, what are some other ways you get your work out there? Do you tend readings? Do you have like an online blog? Well, no, I don't have a blog. Um, I do readings when I can, when, I, when I'm invited. And I'll, I'll do that. Also, I'm a member of the Gulf Coast Poetry um, or Gulf Coast Poets, which is a chapter of the Texas, or the Poetry Society of Texas. And now I'm, the, I'm a lifetime member, and I'm the president of it. And you know, we have open mic, but that's kind of what I've been focusing on. And my goal, I've just recently become president, my goal is to help develop it, keep it. We've got an older generation that's sort of trying to pass on to a younger one, and I want to foment that and get more younger members so that we can keep a core that will go on for a long time, I hope. And, uh, how do you get the word out for the, the Gulf Coast poets, and, and how, do you, how do you try to get the, the younger members in? Well, that's, that's, that's hard, and, and mainly it's word of mouth, and for the members, of course, I have like my own little email distribution list I've created to keep them abreast of things going on. For others, it's really been sort of, I have a lot of friends who I've worked with in different aspects, and they've got an interest to come hear me, and then some of them I try to encourage to come join the group. There's a local librarian who has been very interested in watching the local uh, artists and the local uh, poets and things. And, and even now, she's invited me in August to come speak to a, th a celebration they have at the library to ha have local artists and local poets and writers come in to talk about their art. So it's kind of that. And what I'm hoping, uh, we haven't, as a group, been able to like, break into schools where we can start doing things. But, that's my hope someday. And we're also looking at possibly an anthology so we can spread the word and uh, keep going. One good thing about our group is the founder, I'll call her that, other people were involved, Mary Carlisle. Wonderful lady, wonderful poet, and she's very well known. I mean, you go to most of the poet laureates, Facebook pages, the, the state one, and you'll see this white-haired lady in the background in, some, in one of their pictures, and that's Mary. In almost every single one that has a Facebook page, you're going to see her in the background somewhere. They all know her. And so that's helped us. And my hope is, as we carry on with what she's done and the good work and the good name that she's created for our group. Uh, whenever you do readings, is there a poem that people like to hear, or is there maybe a poem that you do yourself that you, you like to do? Well, it, yeah, uh, typically with readings, it's you know people don't they don't know my stuff enough to ask me, well, will you read this or that? So it, it's it's generally when you're going to have that locally, even if you go to different venues, you're going to just see people you, a lot of times you don't know. So what I I typically like to do is for each one I want to read something different and I, I look for things I've never read to anyone before because I want to sometimes try them out and sometimes I, I feel like it's a, it's a good way of keeping, I don't want to get stale. I've done, I did drama in high school so I, and, I, and, I, and I have done public speaking in college and, and I, I'm a lawyer so I know how to public speaking. I also know that if you're not careful and you just do the same thing, you can sort of set yourself up where you're, you know, your Elvis in his tights, where you're just mimicking yourself. I don't ever want to do that. So I, I want to read, try something different each time as I go through. Okay. Let's go on ahead and, and define poetry. What is poetry for you? 
ready for that. I know everybody has a, a different idea of that. To me, it's a, it's a, a form. It's a it's, it's a written form of expression, and it's it's not prose because it's in verse form. And it can be prose poem. But prose poem have often have verses also. Uh, the distinguish the poetry also to me tends to be more of a snapshot of something, an event, a moment, a thought, uh, an emotion, and are all of them tied together to create emotional content. And the idea what I have with poetry is to create this little scenario, maybe a vignette you might call it, and project that through the poetry and give the reader or the listener something that they want to hear or they want to read, you know, evoke emotional response. So that's how kind of I view that. Okay. Uh, do you feel that poetry is important today? Definitional. It's important to me. It's important to a lot of my friends. I think to the average person, I mean, and it's important that people love it and know it. Is it important to the person down the street? No. Uh, that's the problem because it's slowly over the decades. It's gone from where, you know, Rachel Lindsay, I, you know, I don't know if you remember him, but he did this thing called the Congo Bum, which is a real, really hard, hard to read, but it's a, he, he would read it out loud. He was, he was a performance artist, you know, he wasn't great a poet, but fun poems, I guess, uh, to listen to when they weren't racist, because they were, you know, the Congo and a white guy writing about the Congo, you can imagine. But he would rent out poems, he would rent out a poem, and he packed them. And he make money doing that. Nowadays, I can go rent out a hall, and no one's going to be in that room. And I and one poet uh, told me he went to a reading, and bless his heart, no one showed up. I mean, the problem is, you no, know, to the average person, poetry has ceased to become important, even though, if, if done right, it ought to be. But these guys, you know, you know they, they shy away from it. And I don't know if there's other questions you're going to ask to follow along with that. But as an example, if you walk down the street, and I know people say, well, this is not a fair test, but it is. You walk down the street and ask someone to name five winning, living poets. You know, maybe they'll make, they'll remember Maya Angela, who unfortunately is no longer a living poet. But the rest, they're not, most people won't. Unless you go and say, oh, well, what about, you know, a hip hop artist or something like that? And people might know them. You know, maybe a lot of people might know them, but they're, Others, like in the groups I'm with, wouldn't consider them as poets, even though they're just street poetry to what they do. And so, it, it, it's really become a conundrum, and it's it's a problem for poetry. It's a problem because, you know, we can deny all we want that there's this issue and say it's alive and well, and it's all, everybody's hunky-dory because I go to these meetings where all my fellow poets are very enthusiastic, and we all love it, and that's good. But it doesn't mean we've reached beyond ourselves. We, and, and to me, if you're an artist, in a true art form, you cannot have an art form where the only, the only audience is the artist themselves. You know, if you museum, if you had a museum, and the only people who would go to that museum are the ones who paint it, it folds. Same thing with, you know, you know, a sports event where the only people who would go to the sports event were players. Yeah, you know, you, some people might argue about Greco-Roman wrestling or something, but you can see it, it would just wither. And poetry has become that now, where you go to a, a reading, you go to places, unless it's a Pulitzer Prize winner at a college, you're going to mainly find poets and the friends of the poets or the readers. If you go to a college, well, you're going to have a group that's, you know, my son's in college right now, a group that's getting extra credit from the teacher to be there. Uh, you know, and then there's a group that, you know, doesn't have anything to do that night. And there's another group that, uh, you know, there's a small hardcore of true believers that'll be there to, oh, I want to see this poet. And most of them, you know, you're going to have plenty of seating room uh, for most of the poets that'll go through. And that's really, really unfortunate. And, and we can do all we want, but if all we do is check our own pulse, we're not going to see what we're missing as poets. And there's an audience out there that we need to try to figure out how do we get to them. With this growing problem, do you feel that poetry is dead? Yeah, in a way. I mean, I know it's definitional of dead. And, and I have a lot of reasons. And I realize the people I know, I've talked a little bit about this, they kind of uh, look at me shocked. And, and the reason they do is because it isn't to them. And that's okay. I don't want it to be. I don't want it to. I love poetry. But that does not mean 
that it's it's not suffering and that it's really I mean it may be irreparable in that way and, and there's a lot of reasons for it and you can read about, about it you can do whatever I mean it goes everything from you know the economics you know economics of poetry actually is is weird people say oh you can't make money in poetry but if you really look at it if you think the past 25 to 30 years since the advent of the University of Iowa program writing program MFA programs have boomed all over the country, okay? So now you have all these schools that have programs to teach people creative writing so they can go to other programs to teach people creative writing. So you actually have this whole area where there's people making money and a living with poetry that they never did before. And it's interesting because if you go back and look at the famous poets of, of old, as you said, they were not, most of those people were not related to universities. They weren't attached to the university. They were, they were private citizens doing their own thing. A small handful may have, toward the end of their life, you know, been named poet resident or something like that. But, you know, look at Robert Frost. He was a farmer. Okay, T.S. Eliot. He was a clerical worker. You know, most of these guys, that's not what they did. You know, of course, they chose something that was going to be awful hard to make a living on at the time. Now, if you go into MFA and your PhD in it, and you can teach, this fellow Roger Jones, a really good poet, that's what he does, so he makes a living. He makes a living with 50 years ago, maybe he couldn't have. So, okay, so you have that economics. The economics of selling poetry is different. You know, there's no market, you know, no one, you're not gonna make any money selling poetry. But so why, you know, and then you have your classes and you have people, so why is the poetry like this? Is because it's, it's, it's dying in the sense that smaller and smaller amount of people even read it. Interesting, I was looking this up. The National Endowment of Arts has a, has, does a study every so many years. They call it the Study on the Public Participation in the Arts. And in 2002, they did a study where they surveyed average Americans and they went down 12, something like 12.1% of average Americans said within the year before that survey, they read something that might qualify as poetry. The survey didn't ask, didn't say, this is what poetry is. It just said, have you read poetry? You know, have you read novels? Have you read short stories? Only 12.1%. In 2008, it was down to 8.3%. And again, this is the ordinary folk, the common, not the university guys, you know, and not the enclaves, people like me with our group. And, and that's shrinking. And then you have now, six years later, well, you know, we compete against text messages and we compete against YouTube and Vines and Tango and whatever else is, you know, Snapchat, whatever the, the, the newest thing. So you walk down a mall, you're, you're going to hear kids talk about, you know, what this song or this, uh, maybe even a book. You know, I read the, some thriller that came out of whatever, but you're not going to hear any of them talk about, hey, I read this great poem the other day or I met this great poet. And that's a sad thing because there could be some real life you could help give them. They are taught poetry in high school. Some are taught poetry when they take the English courses in college, although if you look at it, most colleges now you can place out of that English if you take the AP classes in high school. So after AP high school, you don't ever have to read a poem again in your life. And for engineers, you know, they don't have any reason to unless they just suddenly love it. And you get that small enclave. And, and the reason for it seems to be just many things. I mean, it's everything, you can blame anything you want. You can say, well, the creative writing programs created a niche, and unless you're in that niche, they won't recognize the other poets. So, you know, they've excluded everybody. You can argue that the, the, the manner of it being written, you know, T.S. Eliot's Wasteland is the thing when I read about it that's often used because it's so obscure that, you know, the average person, I mean, the average poet can't understand it, much less the average person who doesn't know poetry. So you go through that, and I don't know, you know, I, I think somehow there is, I think there's a disconnect. I think, and this is one thing that a lot of poets have, have decided that it doesn't matter what the emotional response is of the, the, the person who listens to the poem or the person who reads it. They almost, you know, one thing you have to be careful with, like a Gulf Coast Poets or any of those groups, we have the open mic. You have to be careful that you're not just writing and reading to please the people in the group so that you're not just bringing a poem that you know everybody's going to giggle at at the end or something like that. And you can do your crowd pleaser if you want to, but you know, you're not really doing the art the way you'd really like to.
Same thing with you know, publications and all that. And the problem becomes is whatever standards, whatever they're doing, there, there can be a banality where there's a, it's almost this uh, uh, absorption and in, in not just obscurity, but disconnection. Or even if you're writing about, you know, uh, my dad had a tractor and he showed me how to run the tractor and he had this wonderful poem about it. There's ways people can write that where no one can get it and no one can connect to it. A real good poet is um, uh, Glenn Kirby, and he's got a set of things he's writing right now about stories his father told him. And it's really wonderful because he's attempting, I think he's taking a, a real sort of a, a, a in well-written form, a folksy sort of playing, this is life and this is what life really is for the view of it. And, and I think that's a good thing. I hope he does well with when he's going to come out with a book. I hope eventually. But when you know when you're writing about you know how pretty a flower is, or you're writing about you know the snowfall, or you're, you know, or even if you're writing about you know my mama didn't love me or my dad died when I was young, which mine did, if I'm right, you have to be awful damn good to have somebody in the average street want to read that. You know, you got to go through that. Go ahead. Um. So there's, there's definitely a lot of growing issues going on here. Uh, questions about the MFA programs and, and publishers, and, and so there's, there's definitely a lot of uh, topics you're, you're touching on. Uh, let's talk publishers real quick. Do you think that publishers have the power to bring, pub to bring poetry back into the market? Do you think if they marketed it well enough, would it be even feasible? I don't know. I mean, I, I, that's an interesting question. I haven't thought about those terms. Here's, I mean, the one thing I see that's kind of, as far as the accessibility, is the ebook and the beauty. I created was called Creative Space. I think Amazon is. It's now allowing a greater amount of people to be publishers and to connect, so that you can try to broaden that. And and, uh, and I, you know, the, the problem is still. You know, finding that audience and how do you connect with it? And I think, like, I know your press, uh, you've been trying to give some of them away to help, you know, get people to know. And that's one way. But, you know, having the money to do that is hard. I have been uh, to writing conferences, you know, fiction writing, fantasy, world fantasy conference. And so I've been to world fantasy conference, and, and here's this publisher that everybody goes to this table, and they're dying to get this guy to publish their book. And I'm talking to the guy, and he's talking to me about how he works. He quit his job. And he works in his kitchen to put all this stuff together while his wife goes out to earn a living because he doesn't really make any money on the book. And so you think, well, how can then I can take a publisher like that? And this is a guy who had won well, you know, Bram Stoker Awards type things and Hugo and all this for his, his people published, but there's no money for the guy. So how thin can you expect the smaller presses to be able to get to go to anyone? I think it's not just the presses. I think it's got to, there's something in society, and, and that's why it may be, it may not be salvageable. I don't know. Because when you have a society that shuns reading, and, and you can blame the kids, but you, you also have to blame a little bit of the people who write stuff that these people don't want to read. And, and so how do you get back into that? Do you go to the schools and try to have programs? You know, I know Carla Morton, you know, is a, a, a former state lawyer, uh, lawyer, poet laureate, and she does that. But, you know, they, and maybe she gets one or two, you know, or five out of the hundred or a thousand of the group to get all enthused. And maybe that's the best you can do. But, you know, expecting a small publisher, because that's really poetry. Remember, there's no margin for poetry. Expecting them to be able to somehow break through. The only way you can do it is if you, you know, get, you know, you get Bob Dylan or some rock star and, you, you know, you get yourself a big name and a bunch of people want to buy it, you know, or, you know, and I know some of them, they try to be so controversial with, you know, you know, my, my lesbian lover was my mother's dad, you know, that kind of thing, you know, that, you know, okay, well, fine. But then it, it may create some market in some circles, but it, it still gets tough. 
Okay. Um, I've been doing a lot of different inter interviews with different people, right. and so what, what was said in one interview was that America's behind the gap when it comes to poetry. That there's, the rest of the world has a larger presence in the poetry world. There are more people listening to, to poetry than, than Americans. Do you think Americans are behind the gap? Uh, I think I don't know what the gap is. I can't necessarily argue. People say those kind of generalizations. Mm -hmm. It's hard. Now, I will say this. Pablo Neruda was very well known in Chile. Uh, he was. And my wife has gone to Chile many times. And, and he is someone that everybody knew. They loved him. And, you know, they still think that Pinochet may have bumped him off because he died right about the time Pinochet took over. Um, there's some controversy, I guess. So he was very popular. Uh, and I don't know about other poets beyond that. In Europe, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I mean, in England, you had, uh, you know, Sylvia Plath's husband, Robert Hughes, I think was his name. He was very well known. And I think some of his stuff sold well there. But, you know, that was like a super mega name. But when you get past that, I, I don't know. I don't, you know, you look at England when everything you hear about the youth there and, you know, sort of punk came out of there in a way. And so you really think that these people who helped generate punk are really that far ahead of us in poetry? I don't know. I, they may claim so. I don't, I don't know. I, I do want to say one thing, though. You know, you got to remember uh, when the Vulgate, the Vulgate is the first Bible translated to Latin. When it was published, Latin was the common tongue. When Shakespeare wrote his plays, that language that our kids struggle with was the common tongue. So maybe part of the thing is, is that English, common English, maybe because of this giant homogeneous thing of not just television but mass media and all of that, maybe it, it's so melted down and watered down expectations and what people learn and read that we went from Shakespeare being the, you know, the, the, the language of the, the baker and the, the, the butcher to the baker and the butcher now not even able to understand half, you know, five, five of the words out of 20 words. You know, and that's, that's a sad thing. Now maybe in England it's different, I don't know. I'm not going to claim to know that. The internet is accessible everywhere. I mean, right now in this building, I have Wi-Fi. Right. And so I can get on Google, anything I want to do. Um, do you think that the internet has watered down poetry at all? Uh, no. And I'll tell you why. I think the internet helps salvage it to some degree. It was kind of interesting. When, when Yahoo first came out and was beginning to, you know, went from Mosaic to Netscape and then the, you know, the, the big sites, the portals they call them now, but the, you know, they, back then they were just search engines. When they first came out, Yahoo, you know, has their little list of top 10 and all that. One time back like in 96, 97, poetry was in the top 10 of searches. I was amazed by that. It just floored me. Poetry was in the top 10 of searches on Yahoo for a month or two months or something like that. And, and part of it, I think, was because of, you know, like the, um, the Gutenberg project that's trying to get books published, people were, who couldn't, couldn't get stuff were starving to go get it. And with blogs and things like that, it, it allowed a lot of people to get exposed to poetry. And there were a lot of mailing lists that were out there, some big ones with thousands of people involved in them, where you could exchange poems and have hundreds of people, if not thousands, read your poetry. And I belong to some of those. But uh, part of the, you know, it's like anything, super saturation. You know, there's just so many of them. Uh, and then with the advent of the online journals. I mean, I've, I've been nominated twice for Pushcart, but it was through online journals. And the bad part about that is the journals are gone and there's no record. I can't even get them on the Wayback Machine. I know I published them. And, and that's the hard part about that, too. So, and so it, you have this super saturation and then it's, it's only last as long as the individual who wanted to, you know, keep, you know, keep the website up goes. So um, one good thing that happened is the Poetry Foundation, somebody, I forget the lady's name, but she, you know, a while back, this lady died. And, they had always for years tried to get into whatever their other magazines or poetry magazines were, and they never would accept it. And but she loved poetry so much, she left them like $60 million or something like that. So that allowed that, that group to start having, you know, huge databases of poems and also to help sponsor uh, semi-blogs where you could post poems. You know, and I've done a little bit of that where like uh, Occupy Poetry has a, 
a group where you can post some poems. I have someone there, and uh, there's things like that. And that, that's a good thing. And I, I, I think the, the thing about it, 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 you know, you never know when you put something like that. And you can argue, yeah, sure, there's a lot of stuff that's not that good, but once in a while you find something and you see, you know, the breadth of poetry, different places. And, and the good part, too, is that it allows uh, uh, anyone. You know, I can look and you know, I can see what people in England are writing. I can see what people in Australia are writing. I don't have to, you know, you go down to Barnes & Noble and they do have a big poetry section. It's, all, it's shrinking, uh, but it's, it, you know, not, you, you won't get a whole breadth of that. But that way you can, at least now, for the internet. And that's why I think it's actually been a beneficial thing. Uh, and also getting the word out for things like meetings and readings and advertising. And so you can say, well, you know, the internet's water, this, then, that, now. Yeah, sure, you can argue that. But if now we have a way of anybody who wants to know, well, who's reading in Houston? You can, like that, go find it. And, what, and that's a wonderful thing. And, and, you know, we just got to figure out how do we get, you know, how do we get Facebook to donate a space for poetry? You know, something like that. And that's really what you have to do. Where, you know, like, uh, what's his name? Garrison Keeler at NPR had that. You know, the, the poetry, American Poetry Journal, whatever it is, we had the poem of the day for a while they would play, which was wonderful to hear them read. But that's the kind of thing, because those kind of things, people will stop for a minute and look at or listen to. And, you know, we just have to hope, you know, it doesn't, maybe they just open the door a little bit for us, and we just have to knock, too. I think that's part of it. Do you think that we're afraid of knocking? Yeah, I, I think some people. You know what, and, and the reason why, it goes back to one reason why poetry is where it is. I, I think there are some poets. You know, the one thing you can't do when you write poetry is think that because you write poetry, you're necessarily better than anybody else in the world. Or that somehow you have a superior knowledge of the rest of the world or of life. I mean, we all live our lives. We work hard. I work my tush off. And, and I don't apologize that I've done well enough. You know, I'm happy with that. And I grew up, you know, I think I mentioned in a reading the other week when I was a kid. My dad died when I was six. My house burned up the same week he died. It was a lousy week. And, I, you, know, you know, a lot of us have gone through that. But if I start taking the belief that somehow I'm better than the guy who picks up garbage from me at my house, then I'm, you know, I'm wasted. I don't, I shouldn't be writing poetry. And I think there are people who sometimes think of themselves as somehow transcendent or something. And so, because of that, they don't stoop to going to other venues. They, they won't go listen to like the hip hop readers, the Def Jam, the poetry slams and things like that. And, and that, that's unfortunate because you, you just rob yourself of a lot of things and maybe you take away opportunities. One thing like Mary Carlisle with the Gulf Coast Poets, she did, she went to Barnes and Noble and said, can we have our meeting there? And she got them to do it. And they several have times have said, you know, the guys up in the main offices up where it is, the headquarters, have kind of been pending they may take our space because they may have put a kiosk of cookbooks or whatever. We beg them not to, and they don't want to do it, the local guys. They love us there. Uh, and so far, knock on wood, they've kept that from happening. But we have had to move from one space. But, but we have to go ask, and you have to still do it. You know, uh, I think like Dustin Pickering, this this one here, you know, he, he came to Nocturne and he asked them, and, you know, set it up. Uh, you know, not every venue will take that. And, uh, it, it, and this is an eclectic place where we're in a Nocturne, but it's uh, it's something, if you don't ask, you don't ever have a shot at getting it. They may say no, and, but you know, it's like anything else. It's, it's uh, You can be asked a million times, and sometimes all you need one yes, you know, to get what you need. Uh, my uh, this friend of mine, he published a, an, an anthology, a horror anthology, and he said he went to 75 publishers with the idea before one took it. And he was awarded, this is that, he was awarded the uh, Shirley Jackson Award last year for that anthology. So, I mean, the, so the, over the, the, the publications he put in, you just gotta keep persistent and keep going at it. Um. Can you give us your thoughts on independent small presses, presses like uh, Dustin's Transcending Zero Press? I, I love it. I, I, I think they're wonderful. And I think, you know, and the shame of it is, is that, you know, the bigger guys, university guys will go, oh, well, you know, they, they, they will not, I don't think, fully appreciate the love that goes into it and then the opportunity for spreading poetry that comes from that. I, I think, you know, small presses have been the lifeblood of poetry for decades and decades and decades. 
you know, if, if you didn't have them, the only place that you'd have is that, you know, like the, what is it, the Mississippi Review, you know, the Southern Illinois, the Cortland Review, whatever, you'd only have the small handful of people, and they would own it, they would own poetry. And people like Dustin and people like your, your press, you keep that from happening. And so, sure, maybe we're not going to win a Pulitzer Prize by publishing through Dustin, but, you know, but we're going we're gonna to get exposure, and the poetry, poets are going to get uh, local exposure, certainly, and you build out. And it, and it gives, and especially if, if you're dealing with somebody, you give it an opportunity that never had published before, too. And, I, and, I, and that's why also these poetry groups, like what we're in, you know, we want to do an anthology, too. Permian Basin has a one that they're doing. And I think that's good. You open the door, you give a shot. Uh, blind jury so that, you know, someone who writes well, you don't have to go in there and have to know somebody or whatever, or already have a name or be associated with the right university. You can get published and have the chance of saying, here's my poem and here it is. And the nice thing about it, it's in print rather than on just online. Because, you know, online's great, but there's something about having your poem in a book and having it on the shelf is very nice. Have you ever thought of taking some of your work to an independent publisher? Uh, yeah, and, and yeah, the only thing is, um, yeah, I have, and I have done that with the fiction. Uh, most of my, a lot of the fiction is, and there's different, different, because uh, they're, they're, they're in the same thing, especially horror, horror fiction, they, they're the same kind of uh, situation with a lot of independent publishers, and, uh, and I've sent stuff to them. In fact, a, a lot of what I do, will go to an independent publisher probably. You know, the university, the hard part about some of the university ones have only recently uh, gotten into the email submission. I mean, there's still a lot of them that you have to do by heart. And the problem with it is, is they literally take two to three years to respond to you. And then sometimes, I've had, that's one thing I got frustrated with. I would get these letters, we love what you did, we love it, but we're booked for five years and it's just not fair. So go send it someplace. And I already waited two years to get this letter to tell me to send it someplace else. You know, why can't you, if you're booked, just do it. Just don't, don't, you know, close submission. You know, that's what, at least online, they, they close submission. They say, it's closed, stop, don't do it for a while, and then they open it. And then that way they can respond quicker. But a lot of these other journals, they, you know, you don't know any way other than mailing it to them and waiting and waiting and waiting and see, and some of them will never even look at it because you don't even know what happened to it. You know, the old SASE stamp, so for us, envelope, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, I, I, I like, I like what people like Dustin are doing and you, and I also like the local because, you know, this is a group that I help run and I'm part of, we all do it together. But I want to promote you guys and promote the local groups and the local public. Mutabilis Press is another one that's more established, you know, because they've been out there longer. But that's, that's a great thing because we've got some wonderful local poets and this gives avenues and all you need is one or two to take off. All of a sudden they get picked up and they get, they, you know, that's all you need. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, you know, poetry and its historical moments. There's been quite a few moments where, where poets would go out to uh, political rallies and they would rally against hot button issues. Do you think that's happening today? Oh, yeah, well, it is. It is. I, I, I don't do that very often myself. It's just the nature. I have family, you know, things like that that I, and it's very hard to do. But, yeah, I do. And I know of people who have done that. But, and there's like Occupy Poetry is a, is a place where they, you know, if you have something rather revolutionary sort of sounding, that's, they, they want to, it was sort of a, I guess, Occupy Wall Street and they had Occupy Poetry that provide a venue for that. But, um, the hard part is, is I, you know, in the in, in the 50s and 60s, I think there was a lot. You know, Allen Ginsberg being the most famous, you know, besides his howl, is also that one about what is it? Uh, you know, I got something dollar ninety seven in my pocket. You know, fuck you, America. You know, America, um, yeah. Something like that. You know, I love that little book. Um, but you know, he became a very active. But you know, again. It became the province of the megastars that did that. You know, Bob Dylan, I think, is a poet. And he was, of course, until he started just writing love songs. And so they decided, you know, nothing he did was worth well. while. As a, uh, there, there's an article that says, you know, you can tell a medium is still vital if it changes something. Right. Does poetry have the power to change things? I think it does, but it's got to be presented in the right way. I, I think the problem becomes, as an example, uh, you know, and, and you have to kind of bend on this a little bit. Uh, if you want, if you really want 
quality of Ohio. Just a blank piece of paper with words then typed on it may not, because it may not, no one may ever see it. But if you add a little performance art in the reading and then maybe some other montage on top of it, you could have impact. I mean, you could show up on YouTube and you, know, you get enough people hitting it, liking it, then it kind of gets a life on its own. But you have to, again, it's the same thing. You have to have something that people will connect to. you got to have something. <clears throat> and, and, you know, I grew up uh, reading Nicky Giovanni and Berlin Brooks and Leroy Jones as well as everybody else. And what's the one who I am walking? I don't know if you ever remember that poem. And it was a revolutionary poem, a Hispanic one, that kind of helped start the La Raza unit in Texas, uh, moved in Texas. And very good poem. And, and it... Uh, but a lot of that, you know, it's kind of faded, and then, you know, you can overdo that, or people just, you know, okay, you want to shout at me, <laughs> I don't want to hear it. You have to be careful with that, you know, because remember, when you're sitting there trying to convince somebody of something who's dead set against what you believe in, there's no, matter, no amount of shouting that's going to change their mind. So you have to have another way of getting at them and, and talking to them and somehow getting into them. And so maybe poetry would be one way if you do it right, if you kind of, you can walk through. And, you know, uh, does it happen now? I don't know for sure. I won't claim that. I know there are people who will swear that it does, but I think it'd be awful hard to show specific examples uh, for right now. As a poet and as a writer, what is your message to younger poets, people who are just getting their faces out there? Uh, uh, and this is a little classical, I suppose. E.M. Foster in Howard's End, at the very beginning of Howard's End, he, he wrote a word, I, I'm probably going to say it wrong, Something to the effect of only connect is what he wrote. And it's, it's, the, it's like a preface, but it's, it's just those words, only connect. And, and the whole book, when you go through it, is a very you know, highfalutin book, but only connect. And that's what you have to do, I think, as a poet. You have to connect. So if you're a young person, you look for poetry, you connect with. If you want to write it, you write it in a way, you write what you think you know, connects you to somebody else. In a, in, in, in a way that allows them to connect. So it's not so obscure that they can't figure out what you're talking about. But also not just, you know, you don't want to slap someone in the face with the whole idea. You want to give them something to work off of. And it's a hard balance. I'm not, I won't claim I succeed in that, but it's a hard balance. But that's what young poets and young writers have to do. And one of the hardest things, you know, my son has some friends you know, good middle class folks who want to become writers. And I keep thinking, I want to tell them, what the heck do you know in your life that you can write about? You know, and you sit around and make up stuff. Okay, fine. But you know, but you go look at some of these writers. You know, they went to Yale and Harvard and all this stuff, or Tufts University. And you kind of, and I don't know. So you've got to find something. And, and there's a whole, life's real hard for a lot of people. And it's real tough. And the youngsters nowadays, I mean, there's all this stuff around, and, and, and there's this feeling that, almost, that if you don't get it just at the right moment, the right time, it's hopeless, they're gone. And, and so, you have to encourage them, like, and writing is one area where if they can take what they feel and put it in there, besides the therapeutic effect, there's also connecting with others and letting that grow. And maybe, you know, you're not going to be rich doing it, but you may, you may en enrich someone else by doing that. And that's, that to me is what you hope to do. And, and like passing on. You know, and, and even if it's the Greek thing with the catharsis where basically you're, you got this strong emotional thing and so you're allowing someone else in an age of passivity and of, of, of people refusing to have real emotion, you allow them to sense this emotion and to get it out and feel it, and then even if it passes, but for that moment they have lived that emotion in that moment and you've given them something. And if young people can work toward that, you know, rather than just whining, <laughs> they can, I, I think that's something to strive for.